Oh, here we go. With a slight delay. Welcome, gentlemen. The virtual stage is yours. Hello. Thorsten. Hey, Thorsten, okay. go ahead. Okay, I hope you guys can hear us well. Or um, beside, we have a terrible echo, I think, or I mean, at least online. We try our best. So, welcome and please take your seats in this hybrid virtual our space talks today. Um, thank you to the organizers for doing their great job and inviting us. And it's my pleasure to welcome two wonderful space minds in our virtual fireside chat here today. First of all, Robert Zobrin. He is the president at Pioneer Astronautics and established the Mars Society in 1998. He is an international organizer. This is an international organizing advocating at the human Mars missions as a goal by private funding, if that is possible, and we will talk about it later on. And that we have, and that's a, another great pleasure for me to have him first time with me on stage, uh, Rick, Rick Tomlinson, named one of the world's top space visionaries and one of the top 100 most influential people in the space field. He is founder, co-founder of so many space ventures, so XPRIZE, Deep Space Industry for the elder ones or that have been in the industry for, for a bit, New World Institute, Space Frontier Foundation, Earth Flight Foundation, and Space Fund. But I'm sure I'm just scratching here on the surface. I'm Thorsten Greening, I'm your host today, publisher of spacewatch.global, and we are a Switzerland-based online platform for information is about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. And I know many of you are already familiar with our website, the newsletters, our Space Cafe web talk formats, the Space Cafe podcast, and the Space Cafe radio. I would like to ask my guests, and I know both of you are wonderful speakers, for reasonable short answers, so we have a chance for a dialogue. So. Um, and we are not at the UN here, so you don't have to read out your statements. That's also pretty cool. Let me start with the first round. We have heard today in the uh, space talks a lot about commercial space regulation and concerns and so on about space. But having two bright minds on stage, let me challenge you about your thoughts on entrepreneurship. Where do you see the significance of entrepreneurship and the power slash region? of a business plan. And Rick, if you like to go first, that would be wonderful. Well, I think that the system of uh, free enterprise um, and uh, capitalism that lies underneath it, if, it uh, if, an, if it's approached in an enlightened way, uh, which we haven't done so well until now in history, is really a tool that can democratize and create access for the largest number of people to participate in any given area of activity. So doing so in space is a way to, to open it up to as many people as possible. Then excellence can arise. And through that excellence, using market forces, competition, um, we can then find the best way forward in any particular area. Hmm. Our area happens to be spaced, and I think it's a very, very uh, useful tool. And, um, you know, not to get too much into the business plans, but um, there are some, you know, any space business plan basically has to answer the same five or six or maybe 10 points that any other business plan in any other field has to meet. Space is not special when it comes to business. Robert, your thoughts on the significance of entrepreneurship in our industry, in the space industry? Well, I think it's extremely significant. You know, um, before I started Pioneer Astronautics, I uh, worked for Lockheed Martin, Martin Marietta, as it was uh, before that. Um, and uh, Martin had a launch vehicle called the Titan which origins go all the way back to the 50s uh, as an ICBM and then uh, as an actual space launch vehicle. Uh, the Titan II was capable of putting uh, things in orbit. And then it was uh, upgraded with various uh, modifications to the Titan III, 
uh, which was a real workhorse that sent Viking to Mars, for example, um, and a Voyager uh, to the outer solar system, mm -hmm. and then the Titan IV, uh, which was still more powerful. And, uh, but by the 90s, you see, um, because it had been built in, in this way, uh, there were parts of it whose heritage went back to the Titan II and were not appropriate for the Titan IV. Uh, for example, the upper stage of the Titan IV was greatly underpowered. And a number of us engineers went to management and we said, look, we've got a new design for the upper stage, which is more appropriate because the lower stages have been strengthened. And we'll increase the cost of the Titan IV by 10%, but we'll double its payload capability. And management said to us, look, if the Air Force wants us to improve the Titan IV, they'll pay us to do it. <laughs> and so they didn't do it. And, and in fact, the Titans went out of production because their payload capabilities were eventually matched by the Atlas, which was cheaper. Uh, and, and, but they could have taken the time, but they didn't, okay? They, they were on this, this, this string and they didn't want to do anything they weren't being paid to do. Now, contrast that with Elon Musk, okay? Who, with his own money, develops the Falcon 1 and then jumps to the Falcon 9 because the Falcon 1s would only be able to do small payloads. And, uh, and then progressively improved the Falcon 9 increasing its payloads from 10 tons to 20 tons. And, uh, and not only that, uh, making it largely reusable. Um, and, you know, the cost of space launch. Okay, cost of space launch at the very beginning of space age was absolutely astronomical. But by the time of the moon landing, it had declined to $10,000 a kilogram. Okay, so that's 1970. In 2010, it's still $10,000 a kilogram. Okay, 40 years of stagnation. Okay, it was like a law of physics that getting the order would be $10,000 per kilogram. Over the past 10 years, as a consequence of the entrepreneur approach of the Musk's aggressive attempt to improve his thing, even though he's not facing any more real competition, he anticipates competition, okay, right to, uh, the cost of space launch has gone down to $2,000 a kilogram. So that's a factor of five decline in the cost of space launch in, in one decade after 40 years of stagnation. And if he's successful with Starship, it'll go down $400 a kilogram. And, uh, and now why does he need to get it to $400 a kilogram when nobody else can touch him at 2000 Because he knows that there's Chinese companies who are working on duplicating Falcon 9 right now. And if he doesn't have something better in three years, there'll be people that have the same technology and cheaper labor. Yeah, so we will, so we will. the power of, of the entrepreneurial way of thinking. It, it, it's not just that Musk has introduced cheaper systems. He, he's shown uh, uh, the capabilities of an alternative approach. We will come to this price point a bit later and what it enables us. Robert, staying with you, I mean, there's so much money at the moment invested in the space sector all over the place. I mean, it's coming from the, over the last years, it's, it's enormous amounts. And why should anyone invest in space now? Or isn't it too late already uh, that, that all these things are songs are sing, songs are song, song, song. Yeah, well, well, if I were a private investor in the West, if I was a private investor in Russia or China, I'd be looking to develop my own SpaceX because I think I could anticipate uh, a friendly government to help me along the way because they, they need it. But if I was a private investor in the West, that is to say a strictly commercial uh, uh, person, uh, I would at this point not be looking uh, to develop launch vehicles, but to take advantage of the advent of cheap launch vehicles to do all sorts of things in space that had previously been off limits. For example, orbital research labs. Okay, that, you know, NASA had this story with the space shuttle and the space station that we have a reusable launch vehicle, we've got this permanent lab in space, people will be able to do research in unique uh, uh, opportunities in zero gravity, 
uh, and hard vacuum um, and so forth. Uh, but it was all much too expensive. The shuttle was not a cheap launch vehicle at all, and the bureaucratic impediments to getting on it, let alone the space station, were fantastical. Uh, and furthermore, you couldn't keep your IP secret because you got all these other people running around who aren't from your own company and so forth. But the idea of launching uh, your own orbital research lab, okay, when, when the launching a, 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 the equivalent of a space station module to orbit now costs 60 or $70 million, that's well within the uh, reach of a Fortune 500 company to do something like that. Um, you know, it may even be that we get fusion reactor development on orbit. What's the most expensive thing about a fusion reactor is trying to create this huge vacuum vessel. Well, we got a better vacuum in space than, uh, you know, you, you can ever build on Earth uh, the, at any cost. And the, 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 so the idea of orbital research labs, uh, I think that, and, and not only, by the way, does space, is space launch getting cheaper, um, space systems are going to get cheaper. Um, space craft, um, uh, the, the high quality solar panels, and you know, in space you want to not just use the kind of stuff you use on Earth, which is all the cheapest per watt. In space, you also are interested in how much power per square meter and things like this, because it matters. Okay, and but anyway, um, uh, the more the cheaper space launch is, the more space launches there will be, which means there'll be more of a market for people who want to invest in improving space technology because there's more spacecraft to sell it to. And furthermore, the cheaper the launch is, the more interested spacecraft designers will be in novel technology. The, the, the rule in spacecraft design for the past half century has been don't use anything that hasn't been used before. Because if you're building a, a spacecraft that's going to cost you a billion dollars to launch, you don't want to take any chances on something new. But if things are, are a lot cheaper, you can be much less conservative. And so the spacecraft technology itself is going to become cost effective. And so the, the more cost effective the spacecraft technology, the cheaper the launch, the more all sorts of business plans that someone might think of doing can close. You know, Robert Bigelow wanted to do space hotels in, in the 1990s, and it didn't make sense because there was no it, it, inexpensive way to get there. He was hoping that this X-33, the reusable space launcher that NASA was talking about, would come to fruition and that, but it didn't. But space hotels are ridiculous unless there's cheap space launch. But once they become space, cheap space launch, then it becomes a, a, a thing. Um, and, and although I actually like orbital research labs better, um, but because they do more good for more people, they're not mm -hmm. just an enjoyable experience. There's something that will benefit all of humanity. Uh, the, the, but anyway, all these labs, whether they are designed by people committed to the benefit of the human race or designed by people who are thinking of creating pleasure palaces, uh, they'll all become more. Uh, realistic. And so all these different kinds of s uh, space business plans need to be re-examined in the light of cheaper space launch. Right. Thank you very much. Let's, let's get Rick uh, into the conversation here. Um, so, I mean, you're running a space fund now, or a venture, or, um, a venture capitalist. So we have a number of or people in the room or online that have an interest in investing in space. So again, this question, so why should anyone invest in space now or isn't it too late? I mean, there's a price of SpaceX are, are going up and up or, and, and other companies as well. So, I mean, it seems that a few years ago, if you just could spell space the right way, then today it's, it's a done deal. Yeah, um, no, I, I mean, I, I think first, in, um, and I agree with everything Bob said, which probably confuses some people, but the, uh, the fact is that um, it's, it's the opposite of too late. It, it is the perfect time and will be for the next few years. And uh, especially, remember, keep the, think of the lead times for building anything, whether it's an industrial park in space or whatever, there's several years of lead time involved. Um, but let me back up a second here. Um, Part of the problem of the lockout that occurred during the 40 years that Bob was talking about 
um, was uh, when I do my talks, I, let, I, I show a picture of the space station and then I, I hold up my, um, my development platform, which is my, my phone. Um, and which, by the way, the core, you know, the internet and everything that came with this was basically developed by the government and then handed to the people. And amazing things happened, right? You're basically attached to a global brain. The development platform for the human race, the entire human race right now, and I, I'll leave out the Chinese thing for right now just to make the point, but is, is the space station as far as the entire universe. Our access to the universe goes through this little space station. And my old friend, uh, our old friend, uh, Bill Gerstenmeier, used to run Human Space Flight, told me it's roughly 2.75 people to keep the lights on in the space station. So that means you have between you know, a quarter of one person up to maybe four or five, period, representing all of the creativity of the human race accessing this new frontier called space. And all the IP, all the problems Bob talked about as far as developing it in a, in a crowded you know, hotel room, all of these things play into that. So when Elon builds, I, I call it, by the way, the Starship Singularity, if we cross the Starship Singularity, in other words, the railroad, the first railroad gets laid, or steamship, or whatever analogy metaphor you want to use, I, I really don't fracking care if he goes to Mars or the moon, but if he starts delivering 100 or hundreds of people into orbit, and we can have that many more minds out there accessing that platform, the things that they're going to create that we can't even think about right now. So I also agree with Bob that I would not invest, we don't, we try maybe one or two small exceptions not to invest in, in space flight and launch. Um, it's overcrowded. There's going to be a massacre. There's, well, you know, our joke used to be like, what time is it? How many launch companies are there? Right. Um, and um, there's going to be a massacre. It's going to wipe out. There'll probably be maybe room for 10 max uh, uh, on the commercial, on, you know, on the, in the free societies. Um, and so we focus on what we call frontier enabling technologies. In other words, companies that will support or be enabled by regular, routine, repeatable, low cost access to space. And once that happens, Bob is exactly right. We're going to see the development of industrial parks. We're going to see the development of labs. Yes, we'll see the, what you call, pleasure palaces. <laughs> I love that name. Uh, we're going to see all of these things happening out there, right? And, but the main thing, the critical thing, is access to that environment to more human minds so that they can, what we used to call blue sky, I guess we call it black sky. They can dream, they can come up with ideas, they can create new things. And that doesn't just mean products, new ways of being, new societies, all this kind of stuff, once that starts to happen. And I think that it will happen by the turn of this decade. You know, so we're right on the verge of it. So this is the time to get in. Absolutely the time to get in. However, and I want to, I want to wrap up my, my comment with this. You have to be careful. You have to be careful. And part of being careful has to do with don't go after the shiny objects. You know, there's a whole set of rules we can talk about or whatever, but you've got to be very careful with where you put the money. It is so easy to get excited about a rocket. It's less easy to get excited about some new means of uh, optical communication or some rad radiation hardening system or X, Y, Z. Those aren't exciting, but that's, that's where a lot of the money will be made. Seeing, mer seeing more and more people, entrepreneurs, going to space, working with space, or developing this entire market, or having the big guys also, tapping in there. Let's shift gears here a bit. Are entrepreneurs stealing the solar system, particularly the cis lunar environment from the rest of us? How do you see that, Rick? <laughs> yeah, this is one where I know Bob have no opinion whatsoever. Uh, so I'm gonna try and make up something for you. Uh, no, I'm kidding. This is the whole thing, right? This is the whole thing. Our job, our job, is to open the solar system and the universe to life and humanity. Mm. That's, that's the goal. That's why I get up every morning. I believe that's why I exist at this point in time in, in human society. It is 
my job, it is Elon's job, it's Bob's job, it's your job to make sure that A, we save this planet and B, we allow this planet to spread her seeds and, and humanity to expand civilization. And by the way, I, I, I call them the principles of purpose, right? To protect and expand or, or uh, advance human civilization, to protect and expand the domain of life and to explore and experience the universe. To me, if we had a society that became more oriented around those principles over time, that would be an amazing culture to be a part of. And I think that that's where we are. However, the tool that gets us there is a little bit messy right now, right? So we have this, this tool that may not seem so palatable and we call it free enterprise or capitalism or whatever, but I'm sorry, the idea of some sort of grand socialist utopia where everybody knows not owns nothing and there is no cultural advancement because there's nothing in it in terms of why you should advance culture. If you just keep the state steady um, is just, aside from boring, I think it's, it's the way for a society to die. So we have to be, we have to have compassionate capitalism. We have to have awareness in, in what we're doing. We have to look back. One of the beautiful things about now is we can look back into our history. And by the way, when over here in the US, we have the uh, Black Lives Matter, we have Me Too, all of these things happening. Those are just symptoms of the fact that we're able to look back in history through multiple lenses now and we have different perspectives. So we're starting to see how we got to this point and now we can look forward and say, okay, let's not make those mistakes again. Let's bring everybody with us. Let's, let's create an environmental uh, awareness in what we're doing and be careful, not to the point where we freeze ourselves out, right? So we have to be careful. We have to be judicious. We have to be aware. But the entire point of all of this to me is save this planet and spread her seeds out there. And if it takes capitalism to help make that happen, I'm sorry if it showed up and it was uh, a bunch of Maoists with furry wings and that was the way to get there, I would support that. Because I know once we're out there, we're going to do our own thing anyway. But capitalism, free enterprise is the way to go right now, for sure. You got you. I, I will pick up on that uh, a bit later, but just want to, oh, I'm, I'm absolutely curious to hear our boss's view on that. Sure. Um, The habitable solar system does not yet exist. It needs to be created. The people that create it will be giving a gift to humanity uh, that they currently don't have. I, I live here in, in Colorado, okay? Now, um, which is about two thirds of the way from the east to the west coast of the United States. And when the pioneers went west. Um, well, first we did the East Coast and then the Midwest up to the Mississippi River. But then they went straight across from there to California and Oregon. They did not stop in Colorado, okay? It was deemed uninhabitable, uninhabitable. It was called part of the Great American Desert, okay? It was bypassed, it was much too dry. Okay, we get about uh, 20 centimeters of rainfall a year here, okay, and which the uh, agriculture of, of that time would, could not function in I mean, a meter of rainfall. Uh, so, um, the, 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 so they passed it by, but yet it then was developed. People put in railroads and roads and then water pipes and electric lines and so forth. And then um, it became possible to build houses here that people would want to live in. So I bought a house here uh, and the house came with electricity and uh, water and all these things. And the people who created that and therefore, by the way, greatly increased the value of the land that my house is on from what it was originally, which was like nothing, to something that I had to pay something for, uh, they give me a favor because now I can live here. Uh, and so can many other people who are very happy to live here. Okay, so we created a habitable environment. The people who did it 
made money doing it because they took land that was worthless and they turned it into land that was worth something, okay? And, and but that land, which is worth something, the house that I live in, which is habitable because it has electricity and water and even gas lines and everything, uh, that's available to me. You know, I had fish for dinner last night and the fishermen who took it from the ocean didn't steal it from me by stealing it from the common heritage of mankind, the ocean. He or she made it available to me, okay? The, 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 so the people who go out and develop Mars, okay, develop the transportation system to get us to Mars, to establish the first power grid on Mars, and the, the greenhouses that, that, that make food available within certain regions of Mars, they're not stealing that stuff from me. It doesn't exist yet, but they're providing a, an opportunity to my grandchildren who can go there and live there and who hopefully will improve on it still more and make money by doing that, okay? Um, and um, so that's how I feel. It, it, it's an act of creation. Um, okay. You're done, I didn't want to stop you. Um, but thank you very much for, 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 for that view. And I mean, I'm, I'm not a space lawyer. We have our other programs I'm, I'm running with, with, with our Stephen Freeland and others uh, where we greatly discuss all of that. And I leave, leave the, your opinion uh, here as it is. So, but Robert, how can we make sure that humanity makes its own future in space? What can we do here now? Uh, to me or to Rick? To you, to you, to you. Well, um, you know, um, in the 1970s, um, the Pope issued an edict opposing uh, birth control and a, um, I think he was Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts made a wry comment, which is, uh, he no played it a game, he no make it the rules. Um, and the, the, the only people that... <laughs> Play the game, get to make the rule. Okay, now the uh, the human future on Mars is going to be determined by the people that go to Mars, or the people who take part in that enterprise. Um, you know, I was very encouraged by a statement that uh, SpaceX made uh, said that Mars is going to be a free planet. Well, uh, it will. Uh, and it's good that SpaceX it leans in that direction, although I believe that Mars will be a free planet even if they did not support that goal, because uh, the Martians are going to make sure that it's a free planet. Um, and the Mars colonies that are the freest, that do offer people the greatest opportunity to develop and manifest their human potential are going to be the ones that attract the most immigrants. Um, and just from a, a point of view of natural selection, those are going to be the ones that prevail. But, um, Mars is going to be free, not because Elon Musk thinks it's going to be free, although that's a good thing, um, but because the parts of it that aren't free aren't going to grow. No one's going to want to go there. Um, and, you know, uh, and, and, and the, the, the opening up a new planet creates opportunity for people with competing ideas uh, as to what the ideal society should be. Uh, and, you know, the Mars Society, uh, uh, last year we had a contest for people to design a Mars city state. And we asked them to design not just the technology, but the economy, the social system, the political system works. Okay? We had 170 entrance teams entering this conference. People were very interested in this. And the Social systems, the political systems, range from uh, social democratic to libertarian. Um, and uh, and it, it's interesting. And, and, and so, you, which should it be? Should it be Singapore or should it be Scandinavian social democracy? Okay, the, you, there's arguments you can make for both. Um, but experience will determine 
which are the ones that people find attractive and, and, and move to. And then that will become the example, not only for the Mars colonies, but for uh, the rest of humankind. Uh, the, the, you know, people with new ideas of this sort, uh, generally speaking, are, are not uh, popular there. Uh, but having a place where they can go where the rules haven't been written yet and give their ideas a spin then you find that um, uh, it's it, it, a better way is demonstrated and it is emulated. Thank you very much. Rick, what are your thoughts on, on that? How can we make sure that humanity makes its future in space? Is it, can, can I envision an avatar scenario? So sending the space force over to keep control of whatever happened over there, saving the trade roads or, so, what is your what are your thoughts on our future yeah so i mean first of all i mean you can see down there a little space force thing in the uh, the corner here i uh, um you know I, I i as far as space force goes first of all you know whoever approved it as president's irrelevant to me but the fact is that um i i like the idea and i'm trying to push on them all the time that they folk they function less like a space force and more like a space navy and that their job is a little more benevolent their job is making sure the state sea lanes stay open maybe even a, a space guard you know that kind of a thing um but look human beings um i think we've i don't say we've done this planet but we've met ourselves coming the other way we've we've had so many mistakes that we've made. We're basically apes with guns and rockets. We still haven't figured out how to deal with this thing called consciousness and social contracts and all these things. We haven't got that figured out yet. And I believe firmly that taking this next step, breaking out of the cage, climbing out of the cradle, again, whatever your metaphor is, gives us the chance to begin these different kinds of experimentation. Mm. And you know, I, uh, I think that as we get out there, we will start to see new ways of being and, and new ways of interacting. But the key is to enable that and not to apply or enforce doctrines that you may have developed by looking at how we've done the earth and, and taking that and projecting it the wrong way into the future. So for example, uh, Bob was talking about going across the West and, you know, I know some of the people listening are thinking, hold it, there were already indigenous people living there and he's not taking that into account and et cetera. And you know what? I totally get that. And there was some egregious acts that have been done in the name of expanding progress, which by the way, is a cultural phenomenon all around the world. It just didn't happen with Anglos in Europe and it's happened everywhere that human tribes with more advanced technologies advance into places where other tribes lived. But I make no apologies for it, okay? So um, the difference is we haven't run into them out there yet. Now, I wanna make sure we, you know, we use the, uh, you know, the Star Trek thing, you know, being careful when we deal with civilizations, but we're not gonna run into them for quite a while. And so I think it's a matter of, as Bob said, you're basically taking something that is essentially worth nothing and creating value. You're not just creating economic value, you're creating the value for life. And I, I keep going back to that because to me, that's the driver. I, you know, I, I talk about, I want to see trees on the moon. I want to see butterflies on Mars. I want to see the ecosystem expanded mm -hmm. into space. And I want to see access to space expanded as quickly as possible. So, you know, it's really a matter of us using the tools right now that come from a prior age, capitalism, billionaires, um, even the military, all of these tools, whatever tool we can apply to pry this thing open, pry open the airlock, let's say, so that we can go through it and get to the other side. Because what's on the other side is what's exciting. The transition may be tough. It, there may be all kinds of different ideas competing and, and all of this. But the one thing we cannot allow is people who are taking the wrong lessons from history and applying them to the future to try and shut us down. That we cannot allow. Okay. Talking about what is wrong, what is right, uh, I think that is an 
another philosophical question uh, we will not have the time to debate, but what is needed from your point of view to have a sustainable regime in space, that we are not fighting each other, that we are not having conflicts there? Rick. If you're asking me or you're doing about Yes, me. Rick. Me? So I'm, 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 I'll, I'll join it. Sure. Okay. So I'll start with me. Uh, then uh, uh, what we need is uh, a species more advanced than humans. Um, because we right now, again, as I said, we haven't got it all figured out. Right? Now, what I do know is that over time, we do get better. Contrary to what some people think. Right? Now, we may we may hurt more people because of the ability of our technology to kill more people, but the decisions to hurt more people are actually less frequent than they were in the past, right? And, and so as we move into space, I think we will develop ways of working it. I, you know what? I, I think the, the actual signal that space can send our culture, if you think about it, you know, like right now, there's only one place that I know of where Americans and Russians not don't just live together, but actually care for each other. These people love each other. I've met the astronauts and cosmonauts. They love each other, and it's up there in the space station. There's an example there for how to get along, how to work with people, how to be together. And, and I think that's powerful. You know? And as we move out into space, that is the example we can follow. The idea of family values, I'll, I'll turn that on its head. If you're living in a sealed tin can, those people are your freaking family, right? This idea that um, uh, we get into vaccine denial, blah, 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 blah. You're living in a habitat in space. I'm sorry. You know, you're going out the airlock if you're not going to do what's necessary to help protect everybody else in here. You can object on your principles, but I'm sorry, man, you're out. So, and then there's no bigger environmentalist than somebody floating in a tin can and she's breathing her own recycled air and drinking her own urine, looking down at the earth below. So all of these kind of principles that we need right now in our culture, space can exemplify those if we can get that message out to people. I'd like to over, be over, to, over to you. Okay, yeah. Uh, I have here a copy of Time Magazine from April, 1961. Okay, and that's a Yuri Gagarin on the cover. Okay, and uh, you should know in uh, 1960s, there were two principal uh, political magazines in the United States, Time and Newsweek. Um, and is that your Russian friends calling now? No, okay. Uh, the, 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 and Time was the conservative one, Newsweek was the liberal one. So this is a conservative. I think he's pretty frozen right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it goes on for quite a length. It's, um, but here. It seems, Rick, are you still there? I'm still here. Okay, wonderful. So at least the two of us, so. <laughs> Um, I think he'll kick back in. Maybe that phone call hit his bandwidth or something. And <laughs> slow things yeah, down. it's all about resources, you know. It's all about resources. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, that doesn't doesn't look like our, um, he's coming back. Albert, my my last question because we are uh, about to to hit the the fifty minute uh, the forty minute mark, and I was about to ask about the the railroad. What the railroad? can can bring us to to use this meter term, but how, what, how it concludes I... <laughs> <laughs> almost <laughs> ah that was oh robert we, if we, it comes we, back we... in I'll, I'll stop and we can give it back <laughs> My last question are especially for for the guys in the in the audience here is uh, what are your three practical tips for setting up a space company today oh wow that's a good one um true that's i like that one uh you know because you you're i swim in that 
that water all the time. And now you're asking me which, which part of that water am I going to pick up in a glass, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the uh, number one, don't do anything that you're not absolutely passion, impassioned about. You have to really be passionate about what it is you're going to do to the level that you're willing to put up with failure, uh, you're willing to, to deal with long hours, uh, potential challenges to your other relationships, your finances are going to suck, all of these things. So you have to have enough passion to carry you through all of that. Number two, surround yourself with people that have other parts of the brain that you do not have. I'm very, very lucky in Space Fund that I have uh, Megan Crawford and James Mertz, who manage our fund for me. Uh, mm -hmm. our, our space fund too, um, because they, God forbid, I mean, this is how it appeals to me, right? God forbid, they love Excel spreadsheets, you know? And um, I remember uh, meeting with James and he said, you know, the way you, because he's not a space guy, he's a business guy. And that's why we hired him. And he yeah. said, you know, the way you feel about space, that's how I feel about Excel spreadsheets. And I was basically like, dude, you're in, let's go. Um, but when you hire these people, by the way, make sure they can work. I'm going to give you more than three, but make sure that they can work on a team. In my company, I have what I call the, the uh, 1A rule, one asshole per company, and that's me. Everybody else I work with are good, solid people. You might say, well, this person's a genius and they're a pain in the ass. And you're going to pay for that later. So if you could create a, a, a company where you could maybe buy that person's IP and not have them in the company and keep them, you know, on the other side of the door and you slide pizzas under and they give you ideas back, that's good too. The other is um, make sure that there's the market for what it is you're selling. A real market, a verifiable market. And it may not be what other people consider a market. That's part of your vision is to anticipate to some degree. You know, there are so many things. I can look around my desk and see thousands of a dozen things that probably nobody thought there would be a market for before somebody created them. So you have to be able to sort of anticipate the, uh, the availability of a market. Um, those are really the main ones, I think. You know, and, and if you can do that, you know, trust yourself, love what you're going after, bring in people that have other skills than you are, than you do, Make sure you're working with good team. That's the first thing we look at, by the way. Mm -hmm. We look at what is the business they're going into, and then we say, what is the team? Because a bad team can fail at a good idea, but a good team can take a mediocre idea and make it great. So that's critical for us. Yes, sir. You, you get another question as, as um, Bob obviously uh, stuck in the, in <laughs> with all the connection. Yeah. Um, what is different from the three practical tips you just gave us from the normal business towards space? Because for me, it, it sounded very generic what you can apply to every business. So space is nothing different to that. You nailed it, man. That's the point. And it took me a while, right, to really get that. I mean, look, I'm, I'm doing this, this VC thing, um, because I knew nothing about it except that I had been on the other side of the table several times when I was trying to start other companies. Mm -hmm. And, and then I, I looked at it and I was like, okay. And I knew this thing was coming called the starship singularity, whatever. And, and I wanted to get these companies in place. Uh, and by the way, the, the premise of space fund, a little commercial here is that we're taking brilliant frontier enabling technologies. We don't do satellite swarms. We don't do launch vehicles largely. Um, but once they enable the frontier in the development of a space industrial infrastructure. And then we're taking these investors who don't quite know their way around yet largely. And we can help them find those correct investments to make. And so mm -hmm. we put those two together and that's kind of our magic formula. Um, but really, I, I think that, um, I mean, mainly the, the point here is it's just an exciting time for us, you know, to, to get back to the core of it. I think that we are on the verge of destruction or renaissance. You know, in, in the book I have coming out, which uh, hopefully I'll get done in the next two, three months, um, I talk about this as the end of, we're reaching the end of the most important hundred years in human history. And I pick a date of around 1940. What is the and book called? 
I'm going back and forth. It's either going to be the Space Man. I, by the way, if people want to send me their ideas. Space Manifesto, the Space Revolution, or the Space Declaration. I haven't figured it out which one yet. But, okay. uh, I have three covers. I haven't decided. Um, and then the sequels will be the other names. <laughs> I was really going to go with Manifesto, and then people are like, you know, but that's what somebody does before they go into a shopping mall and kill people. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really not my intention uh, so far. But the thing is that we, uh, um, you know, we, we are really in a, uh, in a period of time where um, a, about 100 years ago, 1940, world communication came together, world transport came together, world organizations, the first global corporations, all of these things kind of all the nuclear, all of these things within 10 or 15 years on either side of 1940. Mm -hmm. And so here we are coming up on 2040, and I, I, I truly believe that ironically, we're seeing the end of the arc of a lot of those technologies, a lot of those cultural institutions, a lot of those things, nuclear power, rockets, all of these things, all computers, all coming into this arc, and it ends in about 2040, and we're either going to figure out how to harness that to make life and humanity uh, better, to save the planet and expand the mother world into space, or we're doomed. And it's, it's a, it, to me, it's binary. It's not just that we're going to have climate change and New York's going to become a canal city. I believe, and space has taught us this, we may end up like Venus and everybody's dead. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, I think there's an actual urgency here. And I, I want to wrap this up real quick on, on one point too I want to make. Even though the word makes people in space uncomfortable, impact investing, we're not big on impact in space in, in a different meaning, right? <laughs> that's, that's a problem for a lot of us in space. But the idea of impact investing, the, the ultimate impact investment to me is space. Mm. Because we can see what's wrong with the earth, we can expand the life of uh, <coughs> uh, and humanity in space. And I do believe there are gonna be technologies and things that we develop in space that will help us save the planet. So, um, you know, I kind of veered off there, but yeah. I, I... I leave it with that. Um, I mean, we are almost at the uh, end of our, our talk here. Thank you very much for being my guest, uh, being so open and so kind. So um, thank you, Bob, wherever you are in the universe right now. So I hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy. And as I usually finish my space cafes, don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much. And over to the organizers. Thank you. Round of applause.